All right, guys, what is going on? It is time for another pop culture crisis movie review, but it's not a movie review. It's a television review. It's for episode four of season two of Reacher. This one is entitled A Night at the Symphony. Um, I'm going to get into some spoilers here. I try not to do that too much, but it is probably going to happen a little bit because I have to go through some of the story points. So just forewarned is forearmed. You've been warned. Um, it's directed by Omar Mata and written by Kate Duffy. Now, I don't know if Kate Duffy wrote the episode before this, but Omar Mata definitely directed the episode before this. And episodes one and two were directed by a single director as well, which I kind of like. It helps with the continuity and the flow of the story. It's good. The show starts with them. They have already blown into the front, uh, the front of this company, New Age. They took the SUV right through the front door and they stole a whole bunch of information. Now, after they do that, they realize that their ex teammate Swan worked for this company. This is the company that keeps trying to kill them. That Robert Patrick's character, the head of security, keeps sending people after them. Right? So they figure out that he works for this company. Now they've got all of this data, all of these files, and they're trying to decode what it all means. And they start asking the question. O'Donnell first. He says, like, is it possible Swan was guilty? You know, he worked for this company. You know, sometimes two plus two is four. Um, and, and to the storyline's credit, he asks this question almost to the level of, it's, it's almost comical, right? He asks it a lot and it, I have to wonder, given that I haven't read the books, is there a, a twist or a double cross here coming later on? It's very possible. But also Neely and Dixon are willing to ask this question as well. And two different personality types kind of meet head on in this part of the story. So Dixon, Neely, and uh, and O'Donnell, they're willing to ask this question, like, is he guilty? But Reacher won't hear a word of it. Reacher says, no, I hired him. I brought him into our unit. I'm the one who trusted him. And I think it's a mixture of both fierce loyalty to the people that he's served with, but also you could say that there are shades of ego here, that he could not believe that it's possible that someone would trick him like this, that he would have been such a poor judge of character. If he hired someone who was willing to work for a company that was doing such awful things, what does it say about his skills, right? <clears throat> and the fact that they don't implicitly answer the question as to why he might be so uh, against the idea that he could be guilty, is it loyalty, is it ego? I like that. It adds depth, it adds shades to the character that weren't necessarily there before, and the more growth, the better. But also for the other three, it's important to see these characters be willing to ask the hard questions when Reacher is not because like if you ask the question to somebody who works in law enforcement and says why aren't they allowed to investigate friends, family members, why don't they uh, work on cases that involve loved ones, right? Well, when you're working with loved ones, when you're working on a case with a loved one, you can't be objective. So what you get right here is two different personality types that both have valid reasons for thinking the way they do. Not one nor the other is portrayed as necessarily the right answer, which I really, really like. I do think that this leads into one of the actual problems that's happening with this show right now. And I, there's a couple, again, I'm loving the show, especially the writing, which I'll get into a little bit more later. The dialogue has been superb for me, but it's getting crowded, right? So four main characters, it's, it's a lot to be getting through each episode. And it feels like all of Reacher's moments to shine have been more subdued. He's not getting those great moments where he's deducing all of these facts, where he's coming to these great conclusions and telling you, the audience, through his monologues, how he got there, which is such a seminal part of this character in this series, right? I don't just watch Reacher because Alan Richson is this gigantic action star. I do it because it's the, it's the combination of both an action star and an intelligent person. They come together and they make a full character. That's what I watch the show for. But it's starting to take a back, uh, like a back seat here now because all the other characters are, have to be able to get their parts in as well. Now, I did praise this before because I do believe that <clears throat> one of the things Hollywood has been, uh, has been screwing up a lot lately is that they sacrifice your secondary characters for the sake of the main character. They're willing to make the secondary character stupid so that the main character can look great. Reacher didn't fall into that trap. It was making the other characters characters look great as well. But the problem is now I'm not seeing enough of the main character to really feel like he's getting his moment to shine. I wasn't a huge fan of the way that he seems to be taking a little bit of a backseat to the other characters. He does get one great moment where he does make a strong deduction and he's got a great action scene in this episode that also works really, really well. But it is starting to feel just a tad crowded. 
Uh, it was great to see AM again. The character of AM, the bad guy, has this um, almost posh brutality about him that I really, really enjoy. It's being portrayed by Ferdinand Kingsley. And I would, if anything, I would like to see more of his character. Unfortunately, that would cut more into Reacher's time as well. But I would love to see more of his character and Robert Patrick's character because I think they're both fantastic actors that could elevate the story if they're given the right material. The other big storyline in this episode is they realize after they make this discovery, they figure out what all of these numbers mean. You know, the episodes that are, the the numbers that have been there since episode one. They figure out what those numbers mean, and they figure out the name through an email of this project that New Age was working on called Little Wing. And O'Donnell essentially says, I know this corrupt senator. They're all kind of corrupt. And I know this guy, this guy writes his legislation and he can give us the answers we need to on what this project Little Wing is. And you see this great scene where all of the characters have to get together and work together to corral this corrupt legislative aide and get him put into a compromising position so that you can be reintroduced to the fantastic character of Finley portrayed by Malcolm Goodwin and they get him into an interrogation room where you get a really fantastic scene where yes they get the information out of him Reacher gets the information out of him they figure out what this program is for but they have a back and forth about the nature of politics that's just felt really, really fresh to me. Like in an age now where politics is such a partisan issue, it's not a mention of parties. It's not a mention of right or wrong. They're saying, yes, it's a dirty business. Yes, it's corrupt. That is how you get things done in, in DC. And I actually really, really liked the straightforward nature in which this character portrayed that because it just felt very real to me. It felt like I was watching early season House of Cards for a second there, which I really, really liked. And that dialogue is part of the reason I'm loving the show so much. It was that scene and another one that was just really, really good. And I'll tell you why. So recently we had to go see Aquaman in the Lost Kingdom. And there's one thing that I rail against more than anything when we talk about Hollywood, it's buzzwords. Look, I can take the progressive stories. I don't necessarily hate progressive storytelling. I hate bad storytelling. More than anything, what I hate is the idea that when I'm watching a scene where you're watching a unique character who has his own personality, who has traits all his own, and he's talking not like the character with his own unique background. He's talking like he's a Hollywood screenwriter who has MSNBC or CNN playing in the background as they write their dialogue. If you're a character who has a military background, you should have a different vernacular, a different way of talking, a different view of the world than someone who is a, a DC legislative aide. We had to watch this scene in Aquaman. This is what I'm talking about, bad dialogue. There is a scene there where the Atlanteans talk about greenhouse gases. And I was like, bro, I don't even hate your propaganda. Could you just write good propaganda? I do hate the propaganda. I should say that the, the propaganda would go down a whole lot smoother if you actually wrote it well, but they don't know how to do that. All they know how to do is talk as if they're using these buzzwords is to, is to use these buzzwords that they've been using in all the TV shows for the last five to 10 years. And it's tiresome. Everybody sounds the same because they all sound like they're watching the news. We don't need that. And the best way I can describe how they surpass this in this episode is when they're getting this dossier on this guy who works as a politician, they get a dossier on him and they learn all about him. They look, look, he had a, a low GPA. He got into Ivy League schools because his dad was rich and had connections, constantly got arrested constantly got in trouble but always got bailed out because his family had money and nowadays if you see a character like that if you see writing like that you know what's coming before it's even there they're gonna say white privilege they're gonna talk about how privileged he is right that's gonna be the buzzword privilege 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 well they didn't do that in this episode they got the point across we all know that this is a real thing there are scumbag politicians all over the world there especially here in America there are scumbag politicians that give everyone around them that they know a level up well screwing the little guy well you and me and the rest of us we all have to toil away down here at the bottom while them and the people that they know and support, they all get that leg up. That's a real thing. The problem is when everyone is talking like they're a CNN anchor, you lose people and you break the immersion of the story. So what happens is they give this dossier, they explain what's going on, who this guy is, and the character of Dixon basically says, so he was born somewhere between third base and home and pretended like he got a triple. 
perfect. Now, I, 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 what I love about it is that's a real quote. That was a quote. I, I, I talked about this on Twitter. Like I posted the quote. I said, this is how you do modern Hollywood writing. If you want to put a tinge of social justice bullshit in there, even though I'd argue it's, it's more that it falls in line with the story, but it is, it falls into that category. It's a little bit in the realm of social justice. You want to put it in there, then challenge yourself to write it in a way that doesn't suck. Right. So somebody explained to me that this was the writings of a guy named Jim Hightower who used that exact quote to criticize George Bush. It was also apparently an Eddie Vedder quote from a song. So look, they didn't just take the first exit and use the first thing that came to mind. They thought of something clever that could have been taken right out of the book. Again, I haven't read the book. If it was taken right out of the book, they did the smart thing and they used the quote that they needed to because it did not take me out of the story. I was able to follow right right through and they got their little dig in at class structure without making me want to throw something at the television. That's fantastic. So uh, th the show has definitely got a few hiccups right now. It's a little bit crowded. I think they need to pare down the cast in season three. I would like to see it get back to a, a show where it feels like Reacher really is that centerpiece. My hope is that for the rest of the season, it works its way back to that. And we get back to the case where we're looking at, we're watching Reacher be the physical force that he is. We're watching Reacher make all the deductions that he does because he's as smart as he is. You do get a great action scene at the end here. It's cut a little weird and it's a little bit on the on the side of derivative, but it's great, right? Like uh, I don't necessarily have a problem with a little bit of derivative storytelling if it's done well. So you get some some violence, you get some gore because you get to see Dixon put a, a high heel, like a stiletto shoe through a dude's eye. Like people talk about this in WWE. It's the idea of subverting expectations it wasn't always just a Hollywood thing. Like... The, like with WWE, they had a storyline back in the day, allow me to go off on a little bit of a tangent here, where at WrestleMania 30, what people originally thought they were going to get was that Dave Bautista was going to come back from years on hiatus and he was going to win the championship from Randy Orton. But the problem is that's not the story that people wanted. At that time period, it was all about Daniel Bryan. And there was a, the idea is like, look, you don't need to complicate things. Just because it's a story that's been told before, it's an underdog story, doesn't mean that's bad. And WWE realized that. I think they got a lot of fan backlash going into WrestleMania 30, and they gave the win to Daniel Bryan. It was a classic road to WrestleMania story. Just because it's classic, just because it's been done before, doesn't mean it's bad. You can do fantastic stories that have been done before if you write them smartly, if you have strong cinematography, if you allow the story to organically ask its questions, move from one thing to the next so that nobody gets bored. I think that they're answering questions in the right order. Like, every time you get a question answered, two new questions emerge. It keeps the story moving. Keep the storytelling smooth. Make the dialogue smart. Keep it out of the realm of Hollywood stupidity and modernity. I just think that lately with as poor as the Hollywood storytelling has been, as poor as the dialogue has been, the show has been an absolute breath of fresh air. I hope they make those few small changes that I wanted to see in regards to Reacher taking a little bit of a backseat. I want to see him come to the forefront again. But what did you guys think? Did you guys like this episode? I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. Your critiques might be completely different than mine, so leave them down below and be sure to check back. We'll have episode five review up once the episode's out. Thanks for watching. Listen to full episodes of Pop Culture Crisis on Spotify. Keep up with us on social media and make sure you subscribe and ring that bell so you never miss the show. Bye guys.